Good evening, and thanks for joining us for this episode of Wellness Matters. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Byrd. The American Medical Association was founded in 1847 and is now the largest association of physicians in the United States with over 240,000 members, one of which is me. The AMA works to create a healthier future for patients through research, advocacy, scientific advancement, and improving medical education. We are pleased to have in the studio with us today, Dr. Barbara McEnany, the president of the AMA. Dr. McEnany is a board certified medical oncologist, hematologist from Albuquerque, New Mexico. She served on the AMA board of trustees since 2010, including as its chair in 2015 and 16. Thanks for stopping by the studios, Dr. McEnany. Thank you so much for pleasure. having me. We are so thrilled to have you here. We were thrilled to get you to Muncie uh, and to spend a couple days with us. We're really interested. You've had a series of talks and lectures while you've been here to a wide variety of different constituents. Um, and it's gonna be fun for me as the host of this program to kind of change gears a little bit and listen to your take as the president of the AMA about what that means for our viewers. Um, I think maybe first we could start with uh, a little bit of history about okay. the AMA, and I know you've told us a lot about that. Right, well, as you mentioned, it started in 1847, but our mission is to promote the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. So public health is a very key part of what we do. For example, we commissioned the Flexner Report that made medical school from just a random apprenticeship into something as structured as you offer here at Ball State. Yes. And therefore, patients can understand that their physicians are going to know what's important, what they need to know about healthcare so that they can do a better job taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. We've worked on lots of public health things. We've advocated for tobacco control, for seat belts in cars, for clean water, clean air, vaccinations, a lot of things that have made a huge difference in the public and the health of our American citizens. Yeah, it's just a fantastic thing. Um, what got you interested? You are still practicing medicine I'm a in practicing Albuquerque. Practicing oncologist. Uh, yes. Practicing oncologist. What? Uh, what got you interested in uh, leadership in the American Medical Association? Well, when I was brand new as an oncologist and went to see a patient in the hospital who was only 45 years old and newly diagnosed with end-stage lung cancer, and at those days we could do hardly anything for that. And I was very upset that here was this man in the prime of his life who was going to die because he smoked cigarettes. And he started smoking cigarettes when he was in the armed services. And he continued to do that, and now he's paying the price. And I was very frustrated with this. Why do we sell a product that has the ability to kill people? And so I banded together at the, at the request of one of the medical society presidents at the time with a group of other physicians who were also interested, from primary care doctors to pulmonary doctors, people who dealt with emphysema and the mm -hmm. side effects of, of smoking, cardiologists, and prenatal care physicians who were recognizing that young women who smoke had low birth weight babies, which were, is not a healthy way to get your start in life. Right. And so we all worked together and we went to city council meetings and we helped over several years and we finally passed for our state a statewide Clean Indoor Air Act and we've decreased the amount of smoking. So I'm working hard to put myself out of business, right? As a cancer <laughs> doctor, it would be a good thing. But we all learned that if you work together with other physicians, with the best interest of your patients forefront in your mind, you are an incredibly powerful voice for state legislators, for city councilors. You know, you can get a lot done. We had a little experience with that locally. I, uh, organized a small group of physicians and 
kind of through a grassroots effort, did something very similar a few years Good. ago. We were a, uh, uh, we're a smoking county. We have a very high smoking rate, and we advocated for uh, tobacco-free indoor ordinance. And at the meeting where it was going to be voted on, we had uh, 75 or 80 providers in their Dr. White coats come. And it was a very powerful statement, and our elected officials were uh, courageous enough to uh, go against maybe some of the popular feeling in our community and, and enact that law. Well, as we work on social issues like that, it becomes a lot easier for people because the peer pressure changes. You know, now if you want to smoke a cigarette, you have to go stand outside in the rain. Mm -hmm. um, that makes it less appealing for people. It's, all, it's become less socially acceptable to smoke, which means that if kids don't start by the time they're 18, their chances of starting are much less. So that's valuable. Now everybody gets in the car and buckles their seatbelt. Mm -hmm. We had a lot with looking at car crashes and accidents as a public health issue and figured out that what we needed to do was to not have people go sailing through their windshield. Let's put seatbelts in those cars and make them safer. Yeah. And so the AMA takes on a lot of issues like this. We take on issues that are brought to us by local doctors in their communities who see a problem, bring it forth, band together with other doctors in other states who see the same problems mm -hmm. going on, and then we can work on both the national and the state and the county and community mm -hmm. level to see if we can't do a better job for people in promoting health. So I think that's an interesting thing to understand about the AMA. Uh, we speak to advocacy and we speak to public policy influence. Yes. And I know as president, that will be, I'm assuming, one of your big jobs to continue getting in front of politicians, uh, lawmakers, et cetera, and influencing things that are gonna be for the public health good. We look at ourselves as not only being the voice of physicians, but by being the voice of physicians, we are the voice of patients. And sooner or later, we are all patients. So when, when someone is ill or has a chronic disease, they don't feel well enough. They don't have the energy to fight for a better system to deliver them the health care that they need and hopefully the health they need. So we look at it as our job is to speak for our patients and make sure that we are voicing their concerns and the concerns of doctors and patients work together. Yeah, I think I'd like to take a little bit of time maybe to just go into how the AMA has worked around uh, a couple specific public policy issues. Uh, you and I talked a little bit about, and you know, we've recently had a live show about our local opioid crisis, oh, and I know yes. that the AMA has done a lot of work around opioids. Yes. Tell, us, uh, tell our viewers a little about we that. We do. We established an opioid task force in about 2014, and we had recognized that through well-meaning health policy, pain had been labeled as the fifth vital sign, right. and every patient in the hospital was entitled to a, entitled to a pain-free existence. Well, we've now learned that there's no such thing. It's not, it's not possible to have everyone be pain-free. We were also taught that some of the drugs that we were using to achieve that nirvana pain-free state were not addictive and we didn't have to worry about them. Well, we found that isn't true as well. And so doctors accept some of the responsibility. We, we responded to these pressures. We wanted to keep our patients free of pain. And so we got in the habit of prescribing these drugs, which we didn't think were addictive, but now we know that they're addictive. Mm -hmm. So now what we have is patients who complete a course of therapy for a serious illness or a tragic accident, and they recover from that only to discover that they have the disease of addiction. Yeah. And it is not a moral failing. It's not something that you can decide, I'm not going to be addicted any more than you can decide, I'm not going to be diabetic anymore. It's something that requires intervention. It requires treatment. So we are working very hard, along with a whole series of other organizations, to decrease the prescribing. First, educate ourselves. It's the doctor heal thyself idea. Mm -hmm. We educate ourselves as to how to properly take care of pain. 
We have registries that we can look at to make sure that we are not prescribing something another doctor has already prescribed and duplicating things. We're working with medical schools and other programs to make sure that there are people who know how to treat addiction as an illness. And we have several other policies we're working on, having overdose prevention drugs available out on the streets and in pharmacies and fire stations so that people who do overdose from these drugs don't have to die from that mistake. Mm -hmm. um, we talked earlier around some other things that some people would probably say are a bit controversial to take a stand on if you're an organization like the American Medical Association. Uh, in the news nearly every day now is something about gun violence. Yes. And uh, I don't think there would be anyone who would not advocate for doing something to lessen the amount of gun violence that we have. How has gun violence and gun control affected uh, the AMA? We have very strong policy proposing that we be able to study this as a public health issue, mm -hmm. not as a constitutional issue, not as a, a freedom issue, mm -hmm. but as what is it doing to Americans across the country? How many people are dying or the people who do not die and who then have to spend the rest of their lives getting health care for whatever disability was inflicted? We don't even know the repercussions of this. So the first step in any process is to make the diagnosis before you start treatment. And in order to make a diagnosis in the public health arena, we have to be able to study it. There's an amendment that was attached to a law called the Dickey Amendment, which prevents the National Institute of Health from studying gun violence the way we could study why do people die in car crashes. We didn't ban cars. We figured out you could have seat belts. And cut down the risk of dying in those accidents. So the first thing and the cornerstone of AMA policy is let's release that amendment. Let's put our scientific and research machinery to work through the National Institute of Health and other institutions and be able to study this problem and come up with creative solutions so that we can minimize the risk to our citizens from gun violence. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, we also talked about funding and, and how you advocate for when there are government funds available, what kind of programs should we or should we not uh, be supporting. And one of the public health issues that you and I discussed was teenage pregnancy right. and funding to, to address teenage pregnancy. We've, we had made a lot of progress there. Talk, talk about the AMA stance there. We are at an all-time low right now of teenage pregnancies. And that's a good thing because when a young woman, a teenage woman, waits to have a child, for every year that she waits, her educational status improves, her future income improves, her ability to parent improves. And the health of the child, the chance of that child to have a healthy start in life gets better. So we would prefer that young women have pregnancies when they intend them. And therefore, we were very concerned with the removal of Title X funding from Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood provides a lot of health care services. They provide not only contraceptive care, but cancer screenings, basic education, treatment of simple illnesses that are like bladder infections right. that are related to uh, female fertility and, and just being a woman. Right and being able to have access at a very low cost has been an important part of the safety net. We do not believe that the government should gag physicians and block our ability to advocate for our patients and tell them information that is valuable to that individual woman. And so any policy that prevents physicians from being able to speak freely to their patients, we will oppose. Patients deserve accurate information. They need to be able to trust their doctors to have their best interest at heart and to give them the information they need. This blockade of Title X funding to one particular entity we think is a very dangerous precedent. Tell, go into a little more depth about that. Where is the funding going? 
Well, we, the, theoretically, they expect the federally qualified health centers to be able to pick up the slack, but Planned Parenthood does about 10 times the amount of uh, prenatal care or fertility planning that a, fa a federally qualified health center does. Those are more focused on managing diabetes, mm -hmm. hypertension, all the other chronic illnesses. So not only are you telling this organization it cannot do something that it's become very efficient at doing and very effective and very well received among its clientele, but you're taking this other entity who had a different mission and you're not, and you're saying now you take on this additional burden mm -hmm. and do all this when they are really not set up to do it. Yeah. I do not want to see us lose the gains we've made in women having control of their fertility so that they can plan their families when they are ready to really put their heart and soul and efforts into being a good mother. We spent a lot of time earlier uh, opening up the Pandora's box about, you know, the funding of health care and where that goes and the, the absolute unsustainability of the rise in the cost of health care to our government, the results that we get from it. And it gets into what I'm sure the, the viewers will be uh, interested in knowing too about how we fund Medicaid and how we fund Medicare and, and what happens with all of that. And I think it would be really valuable for our viewers to hear your stance as the president of the AMA about what that looks like and how you and the organization looks at unsustainability of the escalation of the cost of health care. Well, currently in the United States, we spend almost twice as much as other industrialized nations on our health care. Uh, we are approaching $3.3 trillion, and Medicare's prediction is that by 2030, which is not that far away, we will be spending over $5 trillion on health care. There are two big problems with that. One is that if we start spending all of that money on health care, there's nothing left for schools and roads and to make sure the bridges don't fall down right. and make sure we have parks and clean air and other important things in our community. So we cannot funnel all of the resources of the country into health care. It's, it's just not possible. And the second thing is, we are not getting the outcomes that we deserve as a nation. We rank 19th in measurable health outcomes. We rank 42nd in life expectancy. So if we're spending all this money, where is it going and why do we not have better health outcomes from that? And part of the issue there is that other nations will spend a lot more money on what we call the social determinants of health. That much of health is not something that a doctor gives a patient. Health is something that a doctor should be there to educate a patient how to achieve and to patch up the places where it fails. But a lot of having good health are things that patients can do for themselves, being able to exercise in a safe environment, being able to have access to healthy foods, being able to know that you have clean air and clean water, all of those social determinants of health. Your best chance of having good health is to live in the right zip code. Right. We had some very specific discussions about that too. I was very interested in your observations uh, a few years ago. You got the opportunity to travel, travel to Cuba. Yes. And I, I, I thought that was very interesting to see, to see kind of the revelation that you got when you were there. That the way they had set up their primary care was that the primary care physician of a community was also the public health officer mm -hmm. and had abilities to say, this sewage system isn't right. Our primary care doctors don't have that either knowledge or ability. But they had structured it recognizing that the environment the patient lives in has a huge ability to determine the health or the lack of health for that person. And so giving doctors the ability to work with the communities and say, you know, our problem here is that we don't have clean water. Mm -hmm. Let's address that. That is very powerful, I thought. We yeah. maybe should take a lesson from them. I think this whole idea of social determinants of health is something that is 
relatively new and not nearly discussed enough in the health care conversation. Tell us more about kind of that overall way that we look at the consumption of health care. You know, I, I have an onus to run a health care delivery system now, and it's a very different perspective than when I had a private practice practicing family medicine. Uh, and, and I know you advocate for different options for doctors to be able to practice medicine in a way that, that isn't always the way it tends to seem that we're going now. Well, we do think that doctors will know what their community needs and should have the ability to fit their style of practice, private practice versus hospital employed practice versus academic versus other models we haven't even touched on, to be able to fit that into the needs of that particular community. One of the problems that we run into with the social determinants of health is that we don't have any way to measure them. You know, I don't know if my patients are sicker than your patients or not. I don't know if my patients have more or less health advantages in terms of understanding health, uh, having access to food, et cetera, so that they can actually have the same outcomes. Mm -hmm. So when we're comparing doctors to say, are you a good doctor or are you not as good a doctor, we need to know how we're starting. Yeah. And one of the things that AMA is working on that I'm very proud of that organization for doing is we're going to come up with a coding system that respectfully will allow us to measure where people stand in this process of the social determinants of health so that we can say to a physician who starts with somebody whose diabetes is way out of control mm -hmm. and they get it into moderate control that they're doing a great job mm -hmm. and not just reward the physicians who's whose patients were a little bit out of control and yeah. they got them the rest of the way into control and so the numbers yeah. are the target we wanted. Yeah. We need to focus on being able to improve that. We also have a project uh, that we call Improving Health Outcomes where we're looking at diabetes, pre-diabetes, and hypertension. And we're looking at the fact that a doctor, a, a family medicine doctor in his or her office who sees a patient four times a year for 15, 20 minutes is not going to be able to make a good difference in taking somebody who is pre-diabetic and preventing them from becoming mm -hmm. diabetic because they don't have the resources to make these lifestyle changes. So we're trying to create tools to give our primary care doctors the ability to link with the local YMCA, mm -hmm. other local organizations that can add to that right process so that patients can learn how to take control of their own health yeah. and make themselves healthier. If you go on the AMA website, we have a, a little seven question quiz to find out the odds of whether or not you are pre-diabetic. Yeah. Because there are 90 million people in this country who are pre-diabetic and don't know it. And that's the stage where you can reverse that and remember that ounce of prevention is always worth a pound of cure. So St it's time to get up my back family to that. Doctor lifestyle line. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I think one of the other things that I've been very interested in hearing you talk about is, you know, the relationship between the doctor and the patient, and how the AMA helps keep that sacred. And uh, I share the frustration. My physicians share the frustration of data overload and we have brought a lot of that on ourselves right uh, I started practice a little over 30 years ago uh, took over a local family a, a beloved family doctor's practice and he had little yellow cards <laughs> that he stuck in and he would write down a random random number about how much he was going to charge that day for the office <laughs> visit and insurance wasn't involved uh, and boy, the electronic medical record and the technology and the amount of data that we have, it's just overwhelming. Talk a little about that. It is overwhelming. Uh, the electronic health record is a source of dissatisfaction to both doctors and patients. Yes. Patients want to have access to their own information. Doctors also want to have access to their patient's information, whether they got it in my office or your office or a hospital across mm -hmm. the state. We want to be able to have that. And our systems don't do it. They evolved out of billing machinery. Yeah. 
and therefore they're very prone to helping me bill for that patient. But they don't give me the information that I really need when I'm seeing that patient. People think that, that physicians don't like technology. We actually love technology. Almost all physicians have a smartphone and the surgeons love their robots for surgery and we love our linear accelerators to radiate cancers and kill them off. And, you know, we love that technology. We just like technology that works and does the job that we need done. And the modern electronic medical record is frustrating because we have to put in all these useless clicks that have nothing to do with the patient. We often have our back to the patient because we're so busy clicking boxes. That frustrates patients. Yeah. And the data that we're collecting, all those so-called quality measures, Doctors have been surveyed and we agree that about 37% of those quality measures actually measure quality. Yeah. And the rest of them are useless data. So you're taking highly trained, highly motivated professionals and turning them into data entry yeah. clerks for data that no one is ever actually going to use for anything. That's why physicians are frustrated. If we, and at the AMA, one of the things we're looking at is we're about to have a whole new generation of personal medical record devices, things that can measure your blood pressure and send it in, things that can help patients at home have an app that will help mm -hmm. them do this. What we don't know is, are those blood pressure readings done at home accurate or not? Can I make a decision on them or not? How do I take this tsunami of information that patients are sending me about themselves or that we're learning from personalized medicine, from genomics, this huge tidal wave of information that's coming in. How do I sort that in such a way that I can pull out the one piece that I need right now to help me take care of the patients sitting across the table from me? And so as we look at the, the innovation ecosystem that is developing out there, we are working hard to put doctors with those software engineers so that we work together and come up with things that will actually help us take care of patients. And if we can do that and give doctors tools that do that, that will be an amazing use of technology. And it just is so far from just having really efficient billing machinery that, that uh, it would be delightful. Yeah. Well, Barbara, we've, uh, we've unfortunately run out of time. We knew that we were gonna need more time. There were many more things that, uh, that we could have talked about today. Uh, I feel comfortable and confident that under your leadership and what the AMA is trying to do, we'll continue to focus on what's most important, and that's the doctor-patient relationship and our ability to continue to promote great health among the citizens of the United States. And we need all of the doctors of the United States to work with us because when we all work together through a structure like the American Medical Association, there is no limit to the things that we can accomplish for the betterment of the health of our patients. Well, we're gonna to have to wrap things up. And I wanna thank again, Dr. Barbara McEnany, the president of the American Medical Association for sitting down with us in the studio today. For more information about the AMA, videos and resources, visit WIPB.org backslash wellness matters. And until next time, be well.